Hello everyone, I'm your host, Lizzie Chung. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Doc Talk with Liz to learn more about the field of cell biology. Today's episode is featuring cell biologist, Dr. Prashi Avasthi from the Dartmouth Giesel School of Medicine. I hope you enjoy. Hello, everybody. Um, and today we have Dr. Prashi Avasti on. She is a professor of cell biology at Dartmouth in the Giesel School of Medicine. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Avasti. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Of course. And um, can you just start off by telling us a little bit about your journey into science, what got you started, uh, different things you did in your undergrad that um, made you want to go into cell biology? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, I didn't, like many people, I didn't know that much about a research career when I was an undergrad, right? I mean, I think that this is something where, you know, when you're young, you sort of know about, you know, going to med school, and if you're interested in sort of the, you know, life sciences, um, but you aren't that familiar with research. I think probably these days, it's a little bit more common, I would guess, because I think oh, like the kids now are just so, um, I feel very old saying the kids now, but like, <laughs> I think that they are very, um, you know, they just seem to be getting involved in research so much sooner than I think maybe I did or, um, but as an undergrad, you know, just like it was sort of common where people were think, looking for undergrad research opportunities and even people who wanted to go to med school were doing that, right? And um, and I didn't really know much about it, but like like, you know, many students, I had you know, teachers in my biology classes, and I sort of just like cold approached them and said like, hey, you know, do you have any research opportunities? <laughs> you know, just because I, you know, I don't know how you were supposed to do that. Um, and, uh, and so my very first, so I did actually do undergrad research throughout all of my undergrad career, starting from, I think, even the fall of my very, my freshman year. Um, and so I think, so I was taking like, you know, very beginning biology, it was like ecology and, you know, evolution or something like that. And, um, and so I had like a TA or something for that class and just asked him like, do you have any research opportunities? <laughs> and, and so my very, very first research job was like, out, you know, out into the, you know, far, so I went to the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, it's just like central Illinois. Um, and so like out into sort of like the, you know, like fields, far out from campus, there were like these ponds and stuff. And we were, and we were literally like taking sediment from, from these ponds and like skirts that, you know, I was my, like, my job was to sort of like classify these benthic invertebrates, like just tr sort of like is this sort of ecology project to see like, you know, it, it often, um, you know, the types of, of, you know, invertebrates that are in these environments are, you know, a good indication of how that ecosystem is doing. Right. So it's, um, um, often used to sort of judge like water quality and and things like that. So, um, so you know, I I was like literally under the scope, like separating out. I had like my favorite water mites that were really you know beautiful and colorful, and you know I, that's the thing I was doing. And then um, and you know I will admit like I am not very much, I was not at that time very much of an outdoor person. And like you know the thought of like sifting through bugs was just like you know, people talk about that like oh yeah I sifted through. I was like a bug person and that's why I like science and I'm like that is not me like I was not a bug person I was not interested in you know you know getting knee deep in the in the ponds and and sorting through bugs so I was sort of looking for something else after that um and then you know pretty early on I got um you know I I think I had started to learn a little bit from classes and from other people about neuroscience and that seemed really interesting to me so you know I still to this day I think you know other than, you know, single cell organisms, like neurons are probably my favorite kind of cell. Um, and, and they just, you know, just learning about, you know, action potentials and, and, you know, how like a complicated cell that would be like, that could be meters long, you know, how that could, you know, uh, signal from one part of the cell to the other. And th just, there was just a lot of really fascinating things. And so I sort of, I think I've cold approached a, a professor um, at that and just said, you know, do you have any, you know, he was studying synaptic plasticity um, in mice. Um, and so he, um, you know, I just asked if he had any research opportunities. And that is the lab that I probably spent the longest time in as an undergrad. So I think probably almost like three years um, in that lab. And we had done a lot of really interesting, I learned so much about biology in, um, in that lab. You know, we were, um, 
we actually, I had a couple of papers, you know, I was a, an author on a couple of papers from, from that lab um, as an undergrad. And, you know, we were studying, you know, um, you know, in, in mice, mice have, have whiskers and then they sense the environment through, through their whiskers. And, and then that signal, you know, ultimately lands in higher order, you know, um, higher portions of the brain in the cortex. And so, you know, that, that, that pathway is called the whisker, whisker to barrel cortex, because there's, it's called the barrel cortex where, um, where, um, the part of the brain that receives those signals, um, from, um, the somatosensory, um, you know, uh, organs. And so, um, from the whiskers. And so we were actually like characterizing, you know, how neurons in that part part of the, you know, cortex were branched. So we were looking at like the organization and branching of the neurons in the cortex using like a very old school method, which was like, I, I can't believe that this was a thing that people did. It was called like, a, it was called the camera lucida, where you basically have, you know, you have, you're looking in the microscope and there's like a little tube that um that projects you know i mean that 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 goes off the side of the the cam the um microscope and then basically you are like looking in the microscope and like physically drawing what you're seeing <laughs> you know with like with the overlay from the you know it's the the um you know image and so um you know so i had these like hand drawn images of neurons and then we would and you, and you would sort of project that onto a uh, onto a page that had like concentric rings. It was called like a, a um, shoal analysis where you would actually use it to sort of um, quantify the branching of these neurons. So anyway, so I like, you know, so I spent a lot of time doing the usual things like, you know, you know, dissecting brains out of mice and sectioning them and and, and like staining them and looking at, into the microscope and drawing these neurons and, uh, and, and and involved in a bunch of other projects there too. But anyway, it was just like really, truly fascinating, probably my, you know, and it was my first, um, you know, sort of introduction to microscopy, which really became um, important later. But then I did just, I did a ton of other types of research as an undergrad. Like I spent a summer um, in, in California, you know, doing another research project. I my like the coolest thing that I probably, so that, that undergrad research was the, the you know, in the uh, plasticity lab was really, really interesting and probably the most impactful. But the, the thing I like to talk about is that you know, I had this, job that was working for um, an entomologist. So he was like a bug guy, but, but my job was basically doing a literature survey for him. But that, because what he was doing is he was working with NASA and the goal was to build a biomimetic sensor that was like insect hair cells. So they wanted, so NASA for the purpose of building a, you know, um, you know, a, a, like a physical, like electronic sensor, but they wanted to model it after biology. And so we needed to learn a lot of things about like insect hair cells to try and understand it. So I was doing like this, you know, it was just like a literature survey. I was like reading a lot and taking notes and, and like organizing papers and things like that. But like, it's the, probably like the closest I'm ever going to get to working for NASA, which is just the coolest thing ever. So like, I'm never going to ever get over my childhood dream of like being, you know, you know, excited about space. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, I think we all have a dream similar to that. Right? I mean, I think it's amazing. I just, I mean, that's why I think it's so important to have those like big, you know, big, um, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes people think like, oh, we have so many, you know, things that we could do here, you know, why explore space? And it's just like, you know, there's generations of people for whom like it captured our imaginations and we still like, you know, romanticize this idea yes. Of, yes. of science through space, right? Like, I just think it's so cool. But, um, but yeah, so anyway, my point is I did a lot of these undergrad research opportunities and completely like fell in love with the process of doing science, you know, so it was in that, like um, in the brain lab that I was really, um, really learned like, how is it that we learn to learn? How is it that we push for the boundaries of science? Um, you know, and realize like what it is that we don't actually know. So I started asking these questions and even my advisors, you know, the things that they would tell us is given. I was often often questioning those things and saying, okay, but how do we know that? And how do we, you know, um, what does it mean? And what if we find that some of these assumptions are not true? And so, um, you know, and so I would sort of present those things at lab meetings. And, um, and so, you know, I was really encouraged by my advisors, you know, as an undergrad. And I think that made such a huge difference because when you've never done it before and you don't know, you know, what this even is to just have someone tell you like, hey, you know, you are doing really well at this. And, you know, this is, this is, you know, the thing that you're really enjoying. This is, this is what this job is, you know? Um, and so it's kind of, it was really, really fun. And so it became pretty clear to me after I'd done a couple years of undergrad research that I wanted to go to graduate school. Um, and so, um, 
so then I, you know, when it came time to, to graduate, I, I applied for grad school. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. And then going off of this, could you also, um, what, what did you major in if I can? Oh yeah. It was, um, it was like, I had to choose, you know, like, you know, you choose pretty early on. Yes. It was, so I, was, I had majored in, a, the major was called molecular and integrative physiology. Okay. Um, so it was like, it was very much like an organ systems type thing, but, um, but so that, so all my core classes were like physiology based. Um, but then, you know, you know, and when you get into senior undergrad, you get to take a lot more electives. Right. But because I was in this, um, synaptic plasticity lab, um, all of my electives were in neuroscience. So there was no, at that time, there was no like undergraduate neuroscience major. Um, you know, at, and like actually nowhere, <laughs> you know, at that time, that was just like not a thing where like you could as an undergrad major in neuroscience. Um, and so, um, but I, but I could take all of my electives in neuroscience courses. So I ended up doing that for my, my junior and senior years. Um, and then when it came time to apply, I'm pretty sure I don't like totally remember, but I'm pretty sure that I only applied to neuroscience programs. Um, you know, cause I think I was just like completely like enamored of it by that time. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And then um, going along with that, what were some of the obstacles you faced in your undergrad, like with classes, with research, and how did you um, overcome those? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that, you know, I spent like the times that I remember the most was, you know, I spent a lot of time in research over the summer. So I actually never went home for you know, like I, my family lived in like the Chicago land area and, and I went to school in like central Illinois. Um, so it was like driving distance, like three hours basically to go home. Um, and so, but I, you know, every summer that I was in college, I spent it on campus, um, instead of like at home. And so, so I had like, you know, big chunks of time where I would just spend in the lab doing research and, and like, even, you know, for the rest of the time, it was like, I would spend it, you know, a few hours a week, you know, here, on a few days here and there. So I didn't feel like, you know, the balance of like research and like studying was that hard because I felt I like, I don't know, I'm like actually genuinely terrible. I have a terrible memory. So like, <laughs> in some sense, it's, I'm like the worst person to try and like remember what these sorts of things were like, but I do, but I do feel like the bulk of my research was really done over the summer or over all of those summers. Um, and so that's when like a lot of like actual things got done, whereas everything else I was sort of like, oh, I would go in for an hour and like section some brains and, you know, do something. So it wasn't really like very, um, intensive, I would say like throughout the year. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, I mean, I had a lot of fun in college, so it was like, it was just really, you know, I, it was cool just learning all those things and just being in, um, you know, you know, getting to live with your friends and just like, you know, um, you know, so, I mean, I think, and, and, and I actually, I think I wanted to stay on campus because I, my friends were also on campus, you know, um, over the summer. So, um, so yeah, that was really, really fun. So I, yeah, I, I don't, I, I think it wasn't at that time, didn't feel like much of a balancing act, um, you know, cause I was putting most of my research time in, in the summers. Gotcha. Okay. And then could you tell us what you currently research and kind of talk about what you do now? Yes. Um, so, so I am, like, like you said, I'm a, I'm a cell biologist. And that means that I really think about sort of things on this like mesoscale, which are like, you know, we don't study, you know, individual molecules or individual, um, you know, um, structures. And we don't study like organ systems or things like that, we usually study on the subcellular level. So, um, you know, that we study like proteins and, and polymers and organelles and, you know, things that are inside of cells and sort of how things are, you know, dynamic inside of cells and how they, um, you know, how sort of different biological processes work on that scale. Um, and a lot of the tools we use, so we actually use all sorts of different tools. So even though I'm a cell biologist, we use a lot of genetics, we use a lot of, um, you know, um, you know, chemical biology, um, you know, uh, yeah, we, so we do, um, you know, you know, and, and then a huge part, um, a part of the work is doing microscopy and then sort of analysis. So you can, obviously, when you, you do microscopy, you can see a lot of beautiful images, but when you're like doing an experiment and we need to look at differences between images, your eyes are only so good at it and you need to like quantify those. And so, um, so we do a good amount of like image analysis from, um, you know, from those images. So that requires like, you know, just some, um, yeah, just some quantification basically. So, um, um, and yeah, so, I mean, so, so we are really interested in 
uh, you know, the part of the cell that is really the structural element. So um, the, which is called the cytoskeleton, just what it sounds like, the, the skeleton. Itself. <laughs> um, and so, and there are sort of major components of the cytoskeleton, you know, including the larger components, which are microtubules, the, you know, and the smallest components, which are actin. Um, and then, you know, the in, in between are the, in, you know, aptly named intermediate filaments. <laughs> um, and there's also septins and other things, but, um, but, but, you know, we, you know, are interested in studying the structure that's found on almost every cell of the human body, which is called the cilium. It's like an antenna um, that sends and receives signals. And, um, and it is really, really important for the signaling function such that, you know, if it breaks in any sort of cell type, so you have them like literally everywhere. So if it breaks in any sort of cell type, it gives you a variety of different diseases from blindness to kidney cysts to, um, you know, extra fingers and toes, like, you know, so skeletal abnormalities, diabetes, obesity, cancer, you name it it's like related to, you know, dysfunctional cilia, right? Because they're found everywhere. Um, but those are uh, microtubule-based structures, right? So they are like protrusion, like, like an antenna that sticks out of the cell that's made of microtubules. Um, and so in our, you know, our lab, what it's really interested in is looking at the interplay between that structure and all of the microtubule-based processes that re require sort of assembly of that structure and um, how those are influenced by the actin cytoskeleton. So this other cytoskeletal component that also does like many, many things in the cell from, you know, cell, morphology and, um, you know, contractility and motility and all of these other things, um, intracellular trafficking, membrane functions, all of these things. So, um, so, you know, a big chunk of my lab is really focused on understanding, you know, how the actin and microtubule cytoskeletons interact in order to make this ciliary structure. Um, but then, you know, we're still generally interested in how the cilium is formed and regulated and all the mechanisms that dictate you know, when and how it forms re relative to other cellular processes. So, um, you know, people are just working on all sorts of things in the lab about different sort of signaling mechanisms and, and things that are happening inside the cell that dictate how that structure forms. Um, but the cool thing about that is that we are, because the cilium, not only is it on every cell of, you know, virtually every cell of the body, but it's really, really conserved throughout the tree of life. So that means that we can use um, you know, simpler systems, like simple model organisms to study it, including the one we use, which is called um, Chlamydomonas reinhardii, which is a, a unicellular green alga. So it's just this, you know, single cell. It's very similar to yeast, and it has these two cilia, you know, at the top of the uh, surface and that they use to actually swim. Um, but that structure is almost the same as the one you and I have, you know, in all of our cells. And so, but it's just so much easier to study than it is to study a human or a mouse or something. <laughs> you know, it's like a single cell. You can grow them up on Petri dishes. You can, you know, they grow at room temperature. You can grow them in liquid medium. Um, and, um, you know, and so they're really, really easy to study. And we can really do a lot of great biochemistry and genetics and cell biology and, you know, all sorts of, you know, cool techniques on this um, system in a way that's a lot easier to do than, you know, sort of working with, you know, live animals. Okay, I see. To recap the first part of this interview, so far we've gone over Dr. Abbasfi's journey into science where we found that she did a lot of undergraduate research and that it's important to look at many different areas of science to gain a well-rounded perspective. We also learned that mice sense the environment through their whiskers and that the pathway from the whiskers to the cortex in the brain is called the whiskered barrel cortex. We learned that the structural element of the cell is the cytoskeleton, and the largest component of this are microtubules. The smallest component are actin filaments, and the intermediate is called intermediate filaments. She is interested in cilium, it, which send and receive signals like an antenna. They are found everywhere in our body, so if they break, then this can lead to many different diseases and the cilium is conserved well through the tree of life. They use Chlamydomonas reinhardti to study cilium, which is part plant and part animal. Now, what's next for this interview? First, we're going to talk about her jump from neuroscience to her current research and how those are connected. Then we talk about the life of a cell biologist, Following this, we will talk about the different career paths and aspects to consider in science, and then hobbies and interests outside of science, followed by more cool science facts, and lastly, words of encouragement. Yeah. Um, 
And then how did you end up going from, I think you said that you applied to some neuroscience programs mainly. So how did you kind of jump from the neuroscience? Yeah, so biology, cytoskeleton and um, that kind of research that you do. Yeah, it's a really great question. So it turns out that, um, you know, I mentioned that like every one of your cells has one of these structures. So what I was studying in graduate school was the visual system, actually. So um, you may or may not know that the, you know, the part of the, the eye, the retina that, that actually senses light. Um, so the, the, the cells that actually sense the light are called photoreceptors. And they also have receptors like actual protein receptors on their surface. Um, you may have heard of rhodopsin that actually binds to the photons and, um, and has the downstream responses that result in, um, in, in vision. Um, but those cells, the photoreceptors, the outside part, part of those photoreceptors are actually a cilium. <laughs> And so, um, you know, when I was studying this and trying to understand, you know, trafficking throughout the photoreceptor and understanding, you know, how those things are regulating, you know, vision and like maintenance of the, of, of the retina um, and, um, you know, almost everything that I was reading in the literature about like the mechanisms that were dictating, you know, the structure and trafficking and things within the cilium were all found in like this green alga. You know, and I, it's like, no matter what I was reading, I would like keep digging, keep digging. And I would like land in this like <laughs> algal literature. I'm like, oh my God, they found out all these cool things using this like simple model organism. And, you know, when you're, when you're working on like mice and it takes like months, it could take years to get like a, you know, knockout mouse, you know, it just takes a really long time. And it's like, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it's long, right? It takes a long time. And then you look at all the kinds of experiments you could do on a single cell organism and, you know, and genetic screens and all these cool things, you know, you know, doing all of this, like, um, you know, forward genetics and, and, and um, it's just amazing, right? So, so when it came time to then do my um, postdoc, you know, and I was thinking about like, what do I want to do? And I was just so envious <laughs> of the people who got to use these cool model organisms to understand. And I actually, all my postdoc interviews were um, in labs that were studying cilia in different model organisms. So in worm labs and in human cells and in these algal cells. Um, and then of course I still like fell in love with the algal cells and um, ended up doing that for my postdoc, which is why I, we work on it now. But, but the photoreceptor, in the mouse is a neuron, right? Like it's part of the central nervous system, right? So, so I was an, in a neuroscience program in the ophthalmology department doing like work in this neuron. And it just turns out that a really, really great system to study that type of biology is this algal system. And that's how I made the leap. <laughs> okay. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, and then could you kind of give us a glimpse into the life of a cell biology professor kind of like I know that every day is probably different from the past, obviously, but if there's just maybe like certain things that yes. occur, like. Sure. Um, so I will say what I tell most people, which is that I really, really love my job. Um, and I love my job because it is very much shaped by me, right? It is very much, I mean, it, it is the least constraining thing I have ever done in my life. <laughs> you know, I mean, it is really, um, you know, less than, you know, school and all of these other things. Like I really get to decide what to do, what to think about, what to study, how to spend my time. All of those things are very largely up to me, right? Um, and so, and that's why you will never find like two professors that spend their days doing the same thing. <laughs> you know, we all have the same goals, right? Like we are trying to contribute to the body of literature. We are trying to produce science. We are trying to share our science so that we can, um, you know, um, make sure that other scientists can build on it and we can like contribute to the like vast, you know, well of knowledge, right? And then that of course requires money. And so part of the job is to obtain money and funding to, um, so that you can pay yourself and pay other people to like help contribute to doing the science, right? Um, and so, you know, so yes, we all share this thing very much that we are spending our time like obtaining funding and then doing the science and, and communicating the science. And then depending on the type of job you have, you may spend a lot of your time teaching as a professor to like teach um, um, undergraduates or graduate students um, or medical students as the case may be. Um, and so, but, so those are like sort of core features that obviously that everybody knows that professors do, but I will say that like, like I said, that the thing I love about this job so much is that I really get to decide how to spend my days and what to do. So, you know, I, 
since I have started my lab, I actually have not been one of those people who spends a lot of time physically in the lab doing experiments. So um, I know some people do, and some people love that. Some people don't do it and really miss it. <laughs> you know, I actually don't do it that much, and I don't miss it that much. <laughs> um, and it's not because I don't love science. It's not because I didn't have good hands, and it's not because you know I, I didn't enjoy doing experiments. I do enjoy doing experiments, but um, but um, I just I love a lot of aspects of this job, and and I you know don't find that much time to do it anymore, and I and I don't frankly miss it that much. Um, but, you know, so, so, you know, I have a lab full of people, graduate students and, you know, research assistants and postdocs and, um, and I love talking science with them. So, I mean, often you may see me on Twitter, like just, um, like enthusing about some meeting I had with someone in the lab because it's just like we talk science and I get so excited and whenever we have a meeting I get so excited um and even my lab has been like known to on purpose like slow roll me where they just like withhold data and then they wait until the meeting and then they just tell me just to watch me freak out because they know I will because I'm so excited about it so um so that is like a very very common occurrence so I love talking science with the lab we like strategize you know troubleshoot things try and figure out what to, you know what to do um and so you know, it's not uncommon for me to have, you know, a few like individual meetings with people in the lab during the week and then have like a big um, sort of lab meeting at the end of the week. Um, and so that's really, you know, the and then, you know, of course, like every day I'm like reading papers and like we, we have a Slack channel. I don't know if you're familiar with Slack, but we're, we have a, a, a Slack group for the lab where I'm frequently just like dropping papers in there or I'm like, oh, I read this cool thing. We should try this. So like, it's sort of like a running conversation we have like every day <laughs> for like discussing science. So that's like always going on, like chatter in the background. Um, and then, you know, then, the, then, you know, then there's a lot of time spent in like individual meetings doing, doing that kind of work. And then sometimes we have meetings to plan, you know, my, you know, my grants, their grants, you know, plan papers that we're writing. So we have a couple of meetings coming up with um, my graduate students because we're trying to, um, you know, finish up a, you know, revision on a, on a paper, uh, on a preprint that we're going to submit. Um, and so we're, we're, um, you know, so we may have like, you know, time built in to do that. So that's like the, the research part of it where we're spending a lot of time like reading, writing, thinking, you know, troubleshooting, brainstorming. <laughs> that's a, that's a good, that's like one of my favorite things. I love that about this job, right? That's just like, that is the job, right? That's the, that's the fun part of the job. And then, um, and then there's, um, you know, and, you know, I have, like I said, there's different types of, of jobs where sometimes they're at a, like a nine month institution where it's like, what that means is that, you know, the bulk of your salary is covered in order to do teaching. And then there's like medical school jobs where, you know, you are pulling in, um, you know, um, money for um, doing research, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's less of your salary is covered for teaching and you're, you're spending less time teaching um, and you're spending more time doing research. Um, and so I have always, so in my last job and this job, I've al always been in a medical school doing, um, you know, so I do less teaching than, than people who are, you know, teaching a course, you know, three, four times a week. I, I don't spend my time doing that, but, um, um, and I think, I think out of postdoc, I could have done not, I don't want to say I could have done that. I don't want to say like, it is extremely difficult to be a teacher. I don't think, or no, like right now, I don't think I could do that. I think they're really good. They're much better than me at this. They are really, really good. I don't want to make it sound like, oh, I could have done that. Like I could not have done that in the sense that I'm like terrible at it compared to them. There's no doubt about it. But, but I mean, what I meant is that I think at that fork in the road, I could have, you know, I could have, like if I had taken a, like a job that was at an undergrad institution, like I think I would have learned how to do it and gotten better at it and really enjoyed it and done that. And then I, instead I went sort of the med school route and ended up spending a lot of my time doing research. And, um, and so now, you know, my time is like filled up doing that. So it would be, it would be, you know, very difficult for me to then just like do a ton of new teaching, you know, um, so, but then I also have like a lot of other interests. So as you may or may not know from <laughs> the things I talk about on Twitter, um, I'm really interested in, um, you know, thinking about how we do science, thinking about how we communicate science, thinking about publishing, thinking about all those different things. So I'm involved in a lot of those different um, organizations. So this is the sort of like service part of the job. You know, there's like research, teaching and service, right? Um, those are the things that are people, often people are rewarded for and, and promoted for and, you know, what keeps you in your job. And that's like, that's part of the job, right? Um, and so, um, you know, but a lot of the service work I do is very much um, tied to these organizations that I'm involved with. So one of them, I'm, I'm the president of ASAP Bio, which is an organization involved in you know, um, innovation in life sciences communication. So we're really focusing. I'm wearing a t-shirt today that says, let's talk preprints. <laughs> um, and that's because I, had to, I wore that for you. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, that so preprints are basically manuscripts that are 
you know, published on a public server online for like the world to read, you know, before peer review. So rather than sort of like sitting on your data and like not showing it to anyone and then submitting it to a journal and then maybe like spending like months to years, like having that go through the peer review process before anyone ever sees it. Um, here, you just post your like, we have the internet. It's like the new age. We don't need to, <laughs> we don't need to wait for someone to like publish something in print and send uh, send out a magazine, right? Like, you know, so we can literally just put it up on the internet, <laughs> which is what we do. We put it up on a preprint server. Um, and then that means that, yes, it's true. It's not peer reviewed, but now everyone can see it. So not just like two or three people who are reviewing your paper, but like everyone who wants to read it can read it. Um, and so, and then often that results in a lot of really great benefits. One, you don't have to wait two or three years in order for it to see the light of day. So, you know, people can give you their feedback and their suggestions. They can say, oh yeah, we tried that, but did you try this other thing? And, or like, hey, we could, we could contribute, you know, we do this kind of work that you don't do. We could add this piece to the, you know, puzzle. And it's just, and you can sort of, you know, have a broader conversation with, with the scientific community about this work and make it stronger and make it better at a time where it's still not, you know, it's still not in the final version in the journal. So you can still change it, right? So whereas if once it's published in the journal, like no one goes back to like, that's the version of record. You don't like revise that version. You just publish another paper or whatever. So here, like when it's early and you can still change everything, you have that broader conversation with other scientists who care about the work and really work to make it better. And it's really good for science. It's really good for not holding back. I mean, just things, um, the speed of science moves so much faster because you just don't have to wait a couple of years before other people see it, right? And can deci decide what their experiments should be on the basis of that new information, right? It's true. It's not peer reviewed, but they can re like reproduce the work if they want because now they have the, you know, they have something to read and they can use it. So anyway, I'm very much a fan of this type of, um, you know, changing the way we communicate science in this way. Um, and I'm also um, on the board of directors of this open access journal, eLife, which you may have heard of. And it's like, um, you know, we are also trying to push the envelope through that organization to try and change um, and do very sort of preprint focused, like early um, communication and really change this model from being behind closed doors to being more transparent and open and having broader open feedback from um, the community, having it, you know, having these reviews be public um, and really just try to push the push the envelope on, on doing, you know, sort of responsible science, transparent, open science. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so these are sort of my passions and like through all these things I've gotten involved in, um, you know, and this organization called Rescuing Biomedical Research, which is really interested in, you know, science policy and like, you know, trying to find ways that work better for all scientists to, you know, for the workforce to, you know, try so that we can make sure that, um, you know, how science is structured is better for, you know, students and postdocs and and, and faculty and um, and for and that we have a sustainable funding for for science going forward. So these are all things that I'm really, you know, involved in and passionate about. So it is an um, it's common for me to have like several meetings per week, you know, with, you know, people at these organizations that I'm part of and um, to really like, you know, I call it uh, sort of conspiring with the fierce for making science better. That's how I think of it. I really feel like, you know, there are other people who are as passionate as I am about about um, about trying to do these things that will make science better for all of us, right? So for for ourselves, for others, for the people who will come after us, um, and so they are equally, you know, excited about that. And so it's really, really fun to work with those people. So um, so yeah, so I spend my week doing things like reading, writing, you know, um, talking with my students and postdocs, and um, you know, st um, strategizing on the science, but then strategizing about science, <laughs> um, and then also um, yeah, and so th that's really what I spend the, the bulk of my week doing. Um, but I but I love it. And it's one of the great things is that, you know, if you feel like, God, I'm at the end of my rope, I just don't want to do this thing. It's like, oh, there's like 600 other things I could just do instead. They all have to get done. <laughs> you know, so it's just like, I'll just stop working on this for now. I'll work on that thing. You know, I've got this provision for this paper, but I've got this uh, other grant too, but I've got this meeting to have with the student, but I've got also this um, meeting to have about, you know, how to, you know, you know, try to convince people to do some, you know, science a little bit differently. Like it's just, you know, it's it's like a, I don't know if you're, especially if you, if you easily get bored, it's a really fun job. <laughs> yes. Awesome. And then in addition to that, what um, do you like to do in your free time, you know, when like you're, you're stressed, maybe you need a break because we all know yep. that scientists also have lives. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, so I have a family. I have a husband and a son who's seven years old, um, and so um, so I'm often, especially now during the pandemic, I'm home all the time. So um, so yeah, so I'm like spending time with my family. Um, I I like to run, so I'm uh, I'm I, I like to, and I'm, I have now moved to 
you know, Vermont where it's like actually like amazingly beautiful, like much, must, much of the year to do, to like run outside. Um, so that's something I really enjoy doing. I like to read. I like to, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, <laughs> as you may or may not know. I, you know, I, I enjoy cocktails, you know, I, you know, I, there's, I think I have a very sort of, uh, you know, I don't have, I guess the thing I don't have is like, I mean, I do like to run and read and things like that, but I don't have like some sort of like, you know, very intense hobby, you know, like I don't have like a, oh, I do like woodworking or whatever. Like, I don't, I don't have that thing, you know, I feel like that is sort of like, you know, or, you know, yeah, I don't have like any sort of like thing where I'm like very, you know, educated and, um, you know, skilled at or anything. <laughs> I don't have any other skills. Let's just say that. I have a lot of good skills. I have some useful skills, but I don't think like, you know, I don't have any good like hobby type skills. <laughs> I, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I know a lot of people and a lot of professors that are like, they have this like amazing, like, oh, I'm also this artist or I'm also play the guitar or I'm also like into woodworking or whatever. And I don't have like any of that. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't have like those kinds of talents. I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm good at, I'm good with people. I'm good with, like, I'm good at the, you know, I don't know. I, uh, I, I don't have that kind of, I don't have that kind of hobby. <laughs> okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And then um, I, I know that you've um, talked uh, about your science and your research already and like some research you did in undergrad, but um, it, is there like maybe another concept in cell biology that you could just kind of explain right now, like something really interesting that you think a lot of people would kind of just be interested to know? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, so it, it, so I, I talked a little bit about the cytoskeleton. So I'll talk about that a, a little bit more just because I, I just think it's like such an incredible concept to have, you know, you know, the, the, the cool thing that's sort of you know, about the cytoskeleton is that, is that all of the cytoskeletal components are like made up of like individual like monomers, right? And they then like polymerize into these, like these, you know, filaments, right? And so, you know, it's, you can imagine like when you got like the cell flooded with this monomers and then you can make these filaments, but the filaments do like a hundred different things at a hundred different times, right? So it's really important for these things to, to be regulated in, um, you know, what they do in time and in space and in, you know, like, uh, you know, how, how the, um, how their dynamics are regulated in order to do like a hundred different functions. It's like the same protein doing a hundred different things within the same cell, right? So that's a, sort of like an interesting problem, right? To think about, okay, how is this thing that is basically like one protein <laughs> or two proteins, you know, you know, how is that like this, this one single thing doing like such a wide range of things from trafficking to, you know, to sort of cell structure to, you know, um, cell dynamics and cell motility and like endocytosis and, you know, all these other, like, there's just like a hundred different processes that require the cytoskeleton that, you know, and, and they're so locally regulated. Like this part of the cell is, it's this same protein is doing something very different in this part of the cell than it's doing in this part of the cell, right? And so often those things are, you know, dictated by, you know, other proteins that bind the cytoskeleton, right? So that gives you sort of another layer of complexity, right? So instead of it just being about one protein that can be, you know, individual monomers or, you know, long polymers, you know, now you have like another layer of complexity where it, those, you know, polymers and the monomers like bind different types of proteins that then regulate, um, you know, then those can be sort of regulated where and where they are and when they're expressed and things like that. And that can sort of give you another layer of complexity into how things can be sort of function inside the cells. It gives you sort of like a, a an idea of like how complicated you know, it really must be to sort of have this type of regulation and have all of these biological processes happening at the same time, but in different ways in different parts of the cell. So it's just like a fun, I think, cell biological problem to think about. And there's sort of different ways in which you know, you can think about, you know, um, the one that probably, you know, people have heard of is sort of when you think about like compartmentalization of like eukaryotic cells, for example, you know, that, you know, the, often there's like membrane bound organelles and like membranes are regulating these things. And, and like lately it's becoming like more common to study membrane less organelles where you can have sort of, you know, properties of individual proteins that are, that are sort of segregated without membrane. Um, and so, 
um, this sort of this sort of thing has been become more popular um, over the last decade or so. Um, and so just thinking about, again, the spatial organization, this is like something I think cell biologists think a lot about because we're, you know, we're microscopists where you look at stuff and things are and see what, th what things are happening in different parts of the cell. So we think about how how, you know, different proteins and different parts of the cell are segregated, how things get between different parts of the cell, you know, the trafficking component, um, you know, and so and, and how those different um, processes in different parts of the cell are regulated. So it gives you like a little sort of flavor of, you know, cell biology and why I think it's cool. <laughs> okay, awesome. Awesome, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And then um, do you have any words of encouragement in particular for people, of course, like looking to go into science, cell biology, just different types of science? I love science so much. I mean, I, I you know, I, so sometimes people think about like, you know, you will probably hear a lot and people will tell you that science is hard and that science is full of disappointment, right? Because it's really, it's, you know, it's really easy to fail at an experiment, right? And it's like, you like it, you know, and it's, it can be a little bit of a shock at the beginning when you try like put a lot of time and effort into something and you do it really carefully and it doesn't work, right? And it's probably because you don't know what all of the different factors are that go into it. So you didn't like worry about all of the different variables necessarily, right? And then you realize, oh, well, this thing, it mattered, you know, whether I did it this way or this way. And it mattered whether I put in this kind of you know, reagent or this other reagent, you know, and so, so when you, when you sort of don't realize what all the variables are, it's easy to sort of, um, you know, have the experiment not work, right? And also it's easy to have the experiment not work because we don't know what we don't know, right? Like we're discovering new biology. We are the forefront of knowledge, right? So, so yes, it's hard, but the thing that no one tells you, I think, is just how much fun it is to be confused, <laughs> you know, like to just not understand something and to have, you know, that little nugget of something to chew on to just try and figure it out. Like, I feel like I always have this thing that's sort of like sticking in my craw, like, oh, I wish I just understood how this thing worked. And it's kind of always gnawing at me. And so, you know, people think about like, oh, you need to have all this resilience for science because things are really going to fail and you've got to really get used to like only having a few victories and celebrate those victories. To me, I mean, science is my escape right? From like real life problems, right? <laughs> like, I mean, honestly, I think like, you know, when, when like, you know, real life is hard, we're in a pandemic, people die, like it's horrible, right? Like things are like really hard in life, right? But, but science is this beautiful question that you always have something your brain can chew on, right? Like you will never be bored as long as you have like science to think about, right? So I think, I, I hope that people see you know, not just that there is, you know, failure in science, but that failure gives rise to better questions and, and, and more to chew on that gives you something really fun to think about and, and to just really to try and figure out. And, you know, and I just, I hope people, you know, like take that joy in science and take that, 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 that the sort of difficult part of science is also what's so fun about it. Definitely. And then, of course, I can't get enough of the science aspect. So do you possibly have one more fun fact that you can just kind of just something that would blow everybody's mind? <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, like fun fact, but I do think that one thing that people should think about is because is, is um, you know, the types of um, like, what do we study and why? Right. Like, so, you know, I am a basic scientist. And I love trying to understand how stuff works, you know, like for me inside cells and, and things like that. And so and I'm using this like you know, a green alga, which is like part plant, part animal. Like that's what I'm using to study, you know, this very fundamental question that really does impact human health. And often, you know, so sometimes, you know, when we get students in, we, we think about, um, you know, like a lot of students will say like, I want to work on cancer. I want to, which is great. I'm so glad that there are so many people that are really invested in like, you know, solving human health, but I'll sort of wrap this around to something we talked about at the beginning, which is this idea, like when we talked about NASA and space, right? So, you know, the idea of fundamental research, you know, I think that this, this has so much potential. Like, so for example, you know, like the psyllium that I, that, that we study in the lab, you know, this is something, like I said, that's on every cell type of the human body. So I could work on just blindness. Or I could work on the psyllium, which can really, a fundamental un understanding of that could result in understanding of like a hundred different diseases, right? And it's just because, and we just don't know all the ways in which those fundamental discoveries will give rise to different, you know, different science, right? So, so there is something about, there is something uniquely attractive to me about studying fundamental science, which, you know, not for the reasons that we can understand, but all the reasons we can't. 
right? And so that is something that I really want people to sort of think about is, is that, you know, how important basic basic sciences and, and, and how important it is that we fund basic science and that even though, you know, you're not directly solving, you know, this mutation and this one disease, and which is so important, I don't want to take anything away from that, but just how, how much impact you can have just in the same way as like studying studying space and studying science, not just to inspire people to study science, but just that we don't know all of the ways in which all of those fundamental discoveries will give rise to everything. And I think it's really like the pandemic has really brought that into the forefront that all these, you know, you know, decades of research on viruses and decades of research on, you know, uh, you know, these, these sort of um, pathways that are involved in making vaccines, you know, these things, even if we were not studying this specific virus, right, for this specific disease, all of this fundamental knowledge was really needed for us to be able to get to the place where we can vaccinate people within a year of, you know, this, right. this, you know, massive global pandemic, right? So I think that this is one of those things that I just, you know, it's not a, a fun fact, but I really would love for everyone to, to really think about the, the beauty of basic science and the impact that we may not be able to see yet, but it's there. Okay, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me today. This was extremely helpful. And I, and I think everybody's really going to enjoy listening to it when they get the chance. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And it was really nice to meet you. For the last part of this video, we learned that photoreceptors are a type of neuron in the retina that sense light and that photoreceptors have cilium that help them sense the light. We also learned that going into science can give you a very flexible schedule and time can be spent doing a, many different things such as being in meetings, planning, reading papers, and doing experiments. We also learned that the cytoskeletal components are made up of individual monomers that polymerize into filaments. We learned that it's important to focus on how fun it is to be confused in science. It's important not to focus on failure because failure is what gives rise to better questions. Dr. Avosti also mentioned that one protein can have many different functions based off of where it is in the body and the polymers or monomers that bind to it. Lastly, Dr. Avosti mentioned that it's important to maintain a balance. Dr. Avosti has a family, enjoys running, reading, and Twitter in addition to performing science with her lab. Thank you for watching the, the second episode of Doc Talk with Liz. Don't forget to like and subscribe for future videos. Please follow our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for future updates.